Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I am Councilmember Adrian Adams, the chair of this subcommittee. We are joined today by Councilmember Peter Koo. Today, we will hold public hearings on three individual landmark designations by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The first item, LU20, concerns the designation of 827-829 and 831 Broadway as an historic landmark. This landmark site consists of two four-story commercial buildings located on the west side of Broadway between East 12th and East 13th Streets in Manhattan. The site is located in the Second Council District, represented by Council Member Carlina Rivera. The second item is LU21, concerning the designation of the Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House as an individual landmark. The house is a wood frame house designed in the stick style and constructed between 1887 and 1893. The site is located at 30 Center Street on City Island in the Bronx. The third and final item we will hear today is LU-22, concerning the designation of the Stafford Osborne House at 95 Pell Place, also on City Island in the Bronx. Constructed in 1930, the house is an example of a factory-produced craftsman house offered in the Sears Roebuck catalog. Both the Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House and the Sanford Osborne House are located in the 13th Council District, represented by Council Member Jonas. Representatives of the Landmarks Preservation Commission will present all three items today. We will then hear testimony from the public on each item individually. If you would like to testify on any of these items, please see the Sergeant at Arms and fill out an appearance slip indicating the item on which you intend to speak. Our speakers today from our commission, Ali Rasulnajad and Kate McHale. Welcome and please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council member questions? Thank you very much. Uh, before you begin, please identify yourselves for the record. Good morning, I'm Kate Bemis McHale. I'm Ali Rasulinajad. Okay, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Adams and uh, subcommittee members. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having us today to present these three recent designations. Uh, the first we'll be looking at uh, was designated on October 31st, 2017 uh, to designate the 827 to 831 Broadway buildings as an individual landmark. This followed a public hearing held on October 17th, 2017. The 827 to 831 Broadway buildings are twin Civil War era commercial palaces designed by Griffith Thomas in 1866 to 67 for tobacco heir Pierre Lorillard, which are significant for their associations with the prominent abstract expressionist artists, Willem de Kooning, Elaine de Kooning, Paul Jenkins, Larry Poons, Jules Alitsky, and Herbert Ferber. They represent the pivotal era in which New York became the center of the art world after World War II. The commission received written and verbal testimony from 22 people supporting this designation including then council member Rosie Mendez, borough president Gail Brewer, Senator Brad Hoyleman, assembly member Deborah J. Glick, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, the Municipal Art Society of New York, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Willem de Kooning Foundation, Victorian Society of New York, Historic Districts Council, Society for the Architecture of the City and Landmark West. The owner's representative and architect took a neutral position and there was no opposition to the designation. The building's architect, Griffith Thomas, is known for stores in the Soho, Noho, and Ladies Mile historic districts, and the 827 to 831 Broadway buildings capture his transitional work combining stone with cast iron elements. While the ground floors have been sales rooms for a number of retail ten tenants, 
The adaptable lofts were ideal studio spaces for artists, and in the 1950s they began to attract artist tenants as part of a low-rent artist enclave between Union Square and Washington Square. At this time, New York City became the epicenter of the art world as focus began to shift from Europe. And the New York School, an informal association of abstract and expressionist artists, including Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, and others, rose to prominence. Willem de Kooning was a defining figure of the New York School and one of the most renowned abstract expressionists in the history of art. 831 Broadway was the last of his New York City residences before his permanent move to East Hampton. And this is a photo showing him in his studio in that building. Uh, it was here that de Kooning began to experiment with vivid tones, a shift his biographers attribute to the quality of light in his studio, and to deviate in his work from dense urban landscapes to abstract pastoral scenes that anticipated his move from Manhattan. And here we have a photo of him painting a painting called 831 Broadway in 831 Broadway. Uh, on the third floor from 1962 to 63, Elaine de Kooning completed a portrait of John F. Kennedy commissioned by the Truman Library. De Kooning continued to paint and sketch Kennedy from memory here for months until shock at the news of his assassination made her unable to paint for a year. Paul Jenkins acquired the law from Willem de Kooning in 1963 and painted here until the year 2000. Here Jenkins created notable works including Phenomena 831 Broadway, shown on the right, which is, oh sorry, shown on the easel in the 831 Broadway in the center image. Across the hall, MoMA curator William S. Rubin hosted artists and their work in a loft designed by the architect Richard Meyer. Here, in addition to pieces by Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Franz Klein, and others, the apartment held works by Willem de Kooning, Paul Jenkins, Larry Poole's, uh, Poons, and other residents of the buildings. The landmark site includes the original footprints and historic lot configuration of the Broadway buildings and reflects their exceptional cultural significance. These buildings represent the pivotal era in which post-World War II New York City became the center of the art world. The 1827 to 831 Broadway buildings are culturally significant for their association with the abstract expressionist art movement because of the succession of significant artists who lived and worked there and that symbolize an important moment in New York City history and the history of art. I just go straight into the next one. Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, council members, the next two properties were identified as part of an extensive survey of City Island in 2009 to identify the best examples of its historic development and architecture. This resulted in the prioritization of several houses for consideration as individual landmarks. The two properties I'll be presenting, the Booth House and the Stafford House, represent the 19th century and 20th century development of City Island and are fine and remarkably intact examples of their respective architectural styles and periods. They were calendared and heard in 2011. Due to Local Law 76 of 2016, they were set to sunset from the Commission's calendar without further action by the Commission by the end of 2017. The agency felt it was important to move these two properties forward, and the Commission voted to designate both houses on November 28, 2017. The Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House, shown here, was constructed between 1887 and 1893, most likely by Booth himself who had a prolific career as a house builder on City Island. The house is a rare and notable example of the stick style in New York City, a late 19th century style of wood frame house construction that combines the picturesque character of A.J. Downing's cottages with the more modern technology of balloon framing. The landmark site is the tax lot shown here. At the June 28, 2011 public hearing, three people spoke in favor of designation, including representatives of the Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and the Victorian Society of New York. No one testified in opposition. Samuel Booth moved his family to City Island by 1880, and by 1887 and 1889, he purchased several parcels of land on Center Street from William Schofield, a member of one of the island's oldest families. The Booth House was constructed between this time and 1893 when it first appeared on a Sanborn map. The two and a half story wood frame house was designed in the stick style popular at the end of the 19th century. 
characteristic features include its asymmetrical plan and varied massing, cross-gabled roofs with deep eaves, and use of wood clabbered shingles and decorative sawtooth pattern boards. The house passed out of the Booth family in 1959, but remained unchanged until the late 20th century when it was renovated by new owners, all with minimal effect to the historic character of the house's two most visible facades. The Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House is a distinctive example of the 19th century development of City Island and the stick style, which retains a high level of integrity and contributes to the historic character of the island. Uh, and finally, the Stafford Osborne House was also designated on November 28, 2017. This one-story craftsman-style bungalow and its accompanying garage at 95 Pell Place uh, is an unusually intact and increasingly rare example of a mail order building from Sears, Roebuck and Company. 95 Pell Place was erected on this site in 1930 for Captain John H. Stafford and his wife, Gertha. The Stafford House is located on the southern end of City Island in the Bronx. At, at the June 28, 2011 public hearing, representatives of the New York Landmarks Conservancy and the Historic Districts Council uh, spoke in favor of designation. A second public hearing was held on October 25, 2011 at the owner's request. However, no uh, public testimony was offered at that time. But the commission received a letter from the owners opposing designation on the morning of November 28, 2017. The house is related to the maritime history and character of City Island as well as a strong contributor to its architectural heritage. Its owner, John, Captain John H. Stafford, was the yacht captain of the Coruscant a 50-foot commuter yacht owned by Marshall Fields III, the heir to the Marshall Fields department store fortune. Captain Stafford was employed to drive the Coruscant from its birth on City Island at the Nevins Shipyard to Fields Estate on Long Island and Ferry Field and any of his guests between the estate and the New York Yacht Club dock at East 26th Street. After a number of years on City Island, Captain Stafford and his wife chose to buy an empty lot at the southern end of the island close to the shipyard. This area was undergoing development as a middle-class residential community that emphasized the charm and small-town feel of City Island. The staffers selected a home from the Sears, Roebuck & Company catalog of prefabricated house kits. Sears was one of the many mail-order companies that sold homes to budget-conscious middle-class and was also the most successful. Sears' most popular home type was the American bungalow. The Osborne model chosen by the Staffords, which was typical of a craftsman style bungalow, has low hanging cross gabled roofs that shelter deep porches and was advertised as from the Golden West to evoke a warm California climate and a strong link to the outdoors. The Stafford house has, been, has seen remarkably few changes in its 87 year history and remains and retains a high level of integrity. As a remarkably intact St Sears mail order house on City Island, the Stafford Osborne House represents an important period of technological and social innovation in the history of American housing and reflects the pattern of suburban style residential development that occurred on City Island and in the outer boroughs during the early 20th century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I must admit, the uh, thing that I love the most about sharing this subcommittee is hearing the history of these amazing locations recited. I can read about it myself, which I do, but to hear it recited again is just fascinating for me. So I, I really do appreciate uh, the wonderful history um, whenever I enter this room and begin to chair this uh, committee. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, um, Councilmember Koo? Another colleague has just walked in. I would like to recognize Councilmember Miller at this time. Okay. All right, if there are no questions from the committee at this time, I thank you for your testimony. You may step down. Thank you. And we will call on members of the public to testify on any of these items at this time. Again, if you wish to testify, please do see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out an appearance slip. We'll ask first to come up. Uh, yeah, do I get a question? Oh, absolutely. You get a question. I don't, think, I don't have a question for you, but uh, 
the heights of testing to figure out why we have them on, particularly Mr. Rasool needs to have her over there after <laughs> question one. <laughs> Put the, the squeeze on her, ask him something really tough there. Thank you, Council Member Miller. <laughs> okay. Got me worried. Yes. <laughs> Raised by Mary Brown. All right. At this time, we'll ask Ms. Rachel Scow to please come up. Okay, please identify yourself for the record. Rachel Scull. Thank you very much, you may begin. My name is Rachel Scull. I'm a land use lawyer with Greenberg Chard. We represent the owner of the buildings known as 827, 831 Broadway, which were designated as individual landmarks by LTC on October 31st, 2017. Our client, BH Broadway owner LLC, purchased the buildings as well as 47 East 12th Street in August, 2015. They paid $60 million for the property in anticipation of redeveloping it with an approximately 70,000 square foot, 14 story retail and office building. During the following two years, at an additional considerable expense, their architect designed this 14 story building, filed the plans for the new building at the Department of Buildings on June 10, 2016, worked through all of DOB's objections and received approval of the plans for the new building from DOB on June 13, 2017. The first our client heard of any potential interest in the Broadway buildings by LPC was a phone call they received from LPC staff shortly before the Memorial Day weekend in 2017, about two weeks before DOB issued its approval for the new building. This, de this designation could have disastrous financial consequences to our client as they can no longer construct their DOB approved building. We are now working with DXA Studio to come up with a design for an addition of sufficient size to mitigate any financial loss resulting from the landmark designation of the Broadway buildings. We presented our, time, our design at the Commission's January 9th public hearing and received their comments. We will be returning to LPC soon with a revised design to address their concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, colleagues, do you have any questions? Okay, you may step down. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Robert Joseph, you may step up. Mr. Simeon, S Simeon Bankoff. And Andrea Goldwyn, you may step up. Okay, thank you, you may begin. On the Booth House or the Stafford House? Uh, which one? We're looking for both together. Okay. Yes, thank Sounds you. Good. The Municipal Arts Society of New York. Um, I'm Robert Joseph, um, and I'm from the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Uh, MAS supports the designation of the Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House as an individual New York City landmark. We find that the distinctive stick style home is emblematic of the transition between Gothic Revival and Queen Anne architectural styles. Constructed between 1887 and 1893, the home is one of the best representative examples of the stick style from the late 19th century on City Island. Samuel H. Booth, who likely de designed and constructed the house, was a local carpenter on City Island who served but were likely workers in the oyster farming industry and then later the shipbuilding industry. The home itself is known for its asymmetrical massing and gabled roofs with uh, roofs with deep, deep eaves. The landmark designation would pr preserve this late 19th century architectural treasure for future, for future generations. We believe this building warrants protection. 
therefore, to preserve the Booth House, MAS requests that the City Council approve the designation of 30 Center Street as an individual NYC landmark. Thank you. And on the Stafford House, well, we support the designation of the Stafford Osborne House as an individual New York City landmark as well. Craftsman style bungalow uh, from Sears, Roebuck and Company is a stunningly well-preserved example of the Osborne House model uh, advertised by Sears between 1916 and 1929. Although Sears sold approximately 50,000 homes in 400 styles between 1908 and 1940, this particular home is an authentic, intact example of the model that would symbolize the, the suburban style residential development that occurred in New York City and across the rest of the nation during the 20th century. The house was constructed in 1930 for the family of yacht captain John H. Stafford and is recognizable by its front and side porches, low-pitched cross-gabled roof, and its deeply overhanging eaves with exposed rafter ends. In addition to the home itself, the Staffords also purchased a garage from Sears that sits to the rear of the main structure. Designation of this well-preserved early 20th century craftsman-style bungalow would be a testament to the history of mail-order homes and the beginnings of suburbanization in the New York City area. We believe this building warrants protection. To preserve the Stafford Osborne House, MAS recommends the city approve the designation of 95 Pell Street as an individual New York City landmark. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good afternoon, co council members. Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. A pleasure to be uh, here and welcome you uh, to your new position. I'm sorry that I didn't come last week. The Historic Districts Council is the advocate for New York City's designated historic neighborhoods, uh, designated historic districts and neighborhoods meriting preservation. When the Landmarks Preservation Commission turns its attention to the historic resources of City Island in 2011, we proudly supported that initiative, which had been earlier proposed in 2008 by the Bronx Borough President's Landmarks Task Force, although in that instance, the suggestion had been for a small historic district um, in, on the island. The LPC surveyed the community and came back instead with a handful of proposed individual landmarks, of which these, are th these two are the last to be considered. In truth, we felt that was a this was a compromise that did not adequately represent the unique architecture and distinctive s sense of place of City Island, but that does not mean it was a bad proposal, nor did we regard the buildings considered to be less than meritorious. The two buildings before the subcommittee today present distinct and different eras of City Island's history and development. The Booth House, built at the end of the 19th century is a rambling house full of charming Queen Anne style details including multiple gables, decorative verge board, turned columns and brackets. Even with its later additions, it remains a handsome example of stick style architecture in the community and has a long association with the Booth family who could honestly be said to have built much of City Island. Similarly, the Stafford House was the home for almost 60 years to Captain John Stafford, one of the pillars of City Island's maritime community. The house he built for his family was a Sears Roebuck Osborne bungalow, pre-cut and assembled on site by a local carpenter, not the booths. Although many lay people may regard the idea of a prefab house having historic significance as absurd, the, top the topology is enormously significant to the development of housing in America. The Stafford House is an es especially intact example of the type, which is oddly rare in New York City. The house's striking resemblance to the catalog illustration speaks well to its well-preserved state. HTC understands the sense of burden which individual landmark designation can bring to property owners, especially owner-occupants whose home may represent their greatest single financial asset. The dread of government oversight with its specters of cost inflation, elongated schedules, and bureaucratic gumminess can be daunting. It's hard enough to be a homeowner to begin with, much less the owner of an older home with added responsibilities. However, the Landmarks Preservation Commission has decades of experience in working with the private owners of historic properties to make their stewardship as easy as possible and to ensure that owning a historic home is a benefit, not a burden. There are loan programs available from our preservation colleagues, like the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and even governmental grants if you qualify. More importantly, there's a deep well of knowledge and expertise in caring for a historic home, which the LPC can and will provide free of charge. No one is born knowing how to reshingle a roof or repair a wood window, but the LPC and the organized preservation community can provide expertise to help maintain and enhance your investment in your home. In this complex world, I do not like to speak of absolutes, but sometimes one must. The most important aspect of landmark designation is not to ensure the regular maintenance of a historic property, but to ensure its continued existence. 
By designating a property as a landmark, the city is saying that the continued existence of this particular site is important to the story of New York and that New Yorkers, as a community, would be lessened by its loss. That the retention of this building is important not only to us today, but to the people who will follow us in the years to come. The best way to understand history is to physically encounter it, and is our responsibility to the future to have these buildings present and not just as an old postcard in a picture book. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, good day, Chair Adams. Uh, welcome to the subcommittee. Uh, Councilmember Miller, welcome to the World of Landmarks. And Councilmember Koo, good to see you again. Um, I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Ten years ago, the former Bronx Borough President's Historic Preservation Task Force recognized the historic significance of City Island and recommended that it be designated a historic district. While that goal is still very far off, the designations before you today represent the buildings that instill City Island with its special sense of place. 30 Center Street and 95 Pell Place recall different eras in the island's development and parallel trends seen across New York. The Booth House at 30 Center is a turn of the century Queen Anne stick style residence. The Stafford House is a fine model of the Sears catalog craftsman bungalows of pre-war suburban style development. Both possess a picturesque quality that signifies City Island's charms. With their original massing and many intact decorative details, each exhibits a high degree of architectural integrity and certainly merits landmark designation. City Island sometimes feels to the rest of us as though it's an idyllic world away, yet its buildings connect to the larger narrative of our metropolis. These houses are worthy of the guidance and protection of the landmarks law, and we urge the council to affirm these designations. Several years ago, the Conservancy provided a loan and project management assistance to the owners of 175 Belden Street to undertake the award-winning restoration of their Victorian Gothic cottage at the southern end of City Island. We would be happy to discuss those services with the owners of the buildings heard today. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Conservancy's views. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I know that you all do uh, amazing work, and I already know the answer to this, but just for the record, how are your services usually um, accepted or um, how are they received or not by the homeowners of these wonderful buildings? Um, in terms of how do we communicate with them, um, you know, we do outreach to owners of historic buildings, uh, speaking for the Landmarks Conservancy, across the city, in historic districts and individual landmarks. We would be happy to speak with the owners um, of the buildings under discussion today to see if any of our services um, would be helpful to them in terms of um, talking about loans for kind of larger restoration projects, helping project management, providing references of architects and contractors, and even just answering simple questions about their historic buildings. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, committee members, any questions? Okay, hearing none, you may step down and thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify at this time? Okay, seeing no further witnesses on today's items, I will now close the public hearings on LUs 20, 21, and 22. Land use items 20, 21, and 22 will be laid over. I now call for a vote to approve LU 7, the Hubity House, on which we held a public hearing on January 23rd. Since our last hearing on LU 7, Council Member Reynoso, whose district includes Huberty House, has submitted a new statement of support for the designation of that site, a portion of which I will read into the record. Quote, my office has connected with Miss Virginia Giovinco, the legal landlord of, Hu of the Huberty House, several, se several times, both with and without the Landmarks Preservation Commission, to ensure that not only she be informed of what it means for a site to be historically landmarked, but also to provide information on financial programs and resources that can facilitate any future renovations. 
Although Ms. Giovinco and I have opposing views on this designation, I continue to be open and accessible to Ms. Giovinco and assist where feasible when the time comes for renovations or work done to the exterior of the building. Generally, Ms. Giovinco has been more inclined to meet with my office than with LPC to discuss such opportunities, and so I would like to include the caveat that should LPC need to reach out to Ms. Giovinco, our office be present. I strongly support the designation of the Huberty House, and I urge the subcommittee to approve this landmark so that we can ensure that this unique and important building remains in the community, end quote. With that, council, please call the roll. Chair Adams. Aye. Councilmember Koo. Aye. Councilmember Miller. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, uh, LU7 is approved and referred to the full land use committee. Okay, we will hold the vote open for about 10 minutes. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is, we're open, we're still open. <laughs> thank you.